excited to be in church today. I don't know about all of you. I'll just bring all the excitement. <laughs> uh, well, good morning. My name is Tiffany. My husband, Elliot, and I, he was uh, over here today, have the great joy of being able to pastor this group of people called Lifeline Church. Yes. Uh, we have a mission here at the church. You can say it with me if you know it. It's to be a lifeline. That's right, and we do that by leading people into becoming lifelong followers of Jesus, which means no matter where we're at in life, we're giving Jesus everything we are got, and we're just learning to do life with him. Amen? Amen. It's not that complicated, but it really is humbling. <laughs> That's what I'll say. Well, before we jump into a bunch of stuff, I have a bunch of stuff I need to let you know about. So the first one is that Easter Sunday is coming up on April 9th, okay? And awesome, it's a, it's a busy weekend. So there's two things. April 8th is our third or fourth year. I can't remember. I was trying to do the math and COVID made a mess in my brain. So it's our third or fourth year being able to partner with the city of Lodi in order to bring an Easter egg hunt to the city. And this is really cool because it's not like Lifeline went to the city. The city came to Lifeline and said, hey, we're going to put on an Easter egg hunt. Would you guys help us do it? So we get to provide the manpower. They do all the eggs, all the stuffing, but we get to make make the event amazing and partner with them. So if you haven't signed up yet to be a part of the Easter Egg Day Serve, Easter Hunt, whatever, Easter Egg Hunt Day Serve thing uh, that's happening on April 8th, you can do that two ways on the version, not the version Bible app. You can do that on the Church Center app. You can, If you have that app already, you can go to the Sign Ups tab and you can sign up for that. Otherwise, you can see Adam and Kaylee are up here in the front and you can Bob Barn them after service uh, and ask them how they can. There's clipboards and stuff, so there's you know paper ways to do that. The second thing is on Easter Sunday, we're going to have two service times. Everybody say two service service times. The first service time is 9 a.m. Say 9 a.m. The next one is 1030. 1030. Good job. So if you show up at 10 o'clock, what are you? You're e yeah, you're either late or early, okay? So there's two service times on Easter, 9 a.m. and 10.30. Invite your friends and family. We have uh, invite cards out on the seats that you sat on in the darkness. So you can pull those out from underneath you if you want a fresh copy. We're happy to give them to you. Uh, but use those to invite friends and family to the Easter service. And then following the Easter service, we're going to bring a really power-packed, powerful series called All in the Family. And we're going to touch on all the things that matter in life. So bring friends, bring family, invite them to come back after Easter. Then the following week, we're going to do tacos and ice cream. It's free on the house. And then we've got baptisms coming up after that. So April is power pack. Don't miss it. If you've recently given your life to the Lord or you're, you're dancing around the fence of church and next steps, baptism is one of the, the first next steps. And that's simply going public with your faith. It's you go under the water and you realize I've died to my sin. I've died to my old way in my old way of life. And I'm coming alive uh, with with Jesus. So you can sign up to get baptized same way clipboards are, are on the church center app. All right. Is that enough information that I fire hose at you? Awesome. Okay. So we're going to jump into our series. We're in a short series and it's called Last Words. Last Words. And it's all about, there are seven key phrases that Jesus said in the last, during the last week of his life as he was going to be crucified uh, and as we're, as we're moving into Easter. So we're taking time. We're not looking at all seven. We're looking at three. Last week, Pastor Elliot preached a really, really, really moving message on forgive them. And he talked about forgiveness. And so you can go back online and you can find that. And today we're going to talk about a really fun phrase. Uh, it's it's joy-filled and it's hope-filled. And the phrase is, today you will be with me in paradise. Uh, and so it's a really cool phrase. But what I love about it is when Jesus said it and why Jesus said it, which is what we're going to get into. Um, so I'm just going to jump into the scripture. It's out of Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 43 is where we find that Jesus said that. But first, actually, I'm going to pray so that we can prepare our hearts to receive what God wants to do in us. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for who you are. Lord, that you have a message of hope, encouragement, and love for us. There's something you want to drop into our hearts today because you love us and you care for us. Lord, and every day you have something to speak to us because we're, we're your, your precious children. Uh, Lord, it's like when we wake up in the morning, my kids wake up in the morning and they want to come sit on my lap and they just want to snuggle with me and they just want hugs and kisses. Uh, Lord, it's crazy, but that's how you are with us. You want to, us to be in your presence. You want to minister to us. And so would you do that in our hearts this morning? Would you minister to the deepest places where we need you? May we hear from you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Luke 23, 39 through 43, 
We are, Jesus has, I'm going to set it up a little bit for you because Jesus has already experienced excruciating pain. The garden of Gethsemane where he has prayed has already happened. They've already come to get him. He's already been tried at night, which was illegal. He's been mocked. He's been ridiculed. He's been beaten. And he's already been hung up on the cross when we pick it up here. Okay, and we'll, we'll backtrack and we'll look at the whole story, but we're, we're going to pick it up when he's already hanging on the cross. And it says, what we see here is that Jesus isn't alone when he's hanging on the cross. And when you guys know the story, we know this story, but I want you to, to see it in new light because Jesus is hanging up on the cross, but there is one on either side of him. So Jesus wasn't crucified alone. He was crucified on the same day as two other people. And so this is where we pick up the stories. It says, one of the criminals hanging beside Jesus scoffed and said to him, so you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. Anybody ever had a really bad day and you're still grumpy and angry and taking it out on somebody else? Like, no, no repentance, no forgiveness, no mercy, no nothing. It's somebody else's fault. And you're, okay, rage monster was right there. Okay. And then the other guy says, but the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you've been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. So there's that guy who comes to the defense. He at least has some scruples about him. You know, he realizes I'm supposed to be on the cross. I have, I have done, this is justice. I'm getting what I deserve. I deserve to be here. You're an idiot because of the way you're talking. And then he looks over at Jesus and in his final moments of life goes, ah, if there's any way, if there's any hope, maybe this guy can do it. So he looks over at Jesus and he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, this is where it comes from, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. So what I want us to see first here is that Jesus' bad day happened to be a pretty bad day for two other people as well. And it was the same kind of bad day. And all three of them responded in different ways ways. You ever found yourself in a bad day with other people and you notice that you guys, you know, some of us are the complainers where we're rage monsters. Nothing's our fault. Everything is someone else and someone else has to fix it. There's other times where we find ourselves repentant. We know we're, you know, we, we screwed up life pretty bad, uh, but we're at least apologetic and repentant and we're looking for answers. We're looking for a way out. And then there's someone who just seems to like know how to do things, you know, in the middle of that. So as you read through the Easter story, it's easy to picture Jesus as being all alone. Because if you think about it, you back all the way up. We know that, that Jesus is betrayed by Judas. You know, they're having the Last Supper and Jesus, they break bread and Jesus says, what you're about to do, do quickly. So he knew the moment of betrayal was there. It was upon him and he knew it was happening. And then we know that Jesus is abandoned by his friends. Peter says, I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to deny you. And Jesus says, I assure you, before the rooster crows three times, you will, dis or before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And then Peter makes eye contact with, with Jesus the third time and he realizes I just betrayed. So one of the people closest to Jesus has betrayed him uh, and abandoned him. He's uh, been denied by the one very close to him. And then he's been mocked mocked and ridiculed by both government and religious leaders. And if you back up and you pay attention, this is why this matters, because the last words of Jesus, Jesus talked a lot. <laughs> he came here to preach and teach the kingdom. So he, he, he was preaching and he was teaching and he was performing miracles, but he, he, had a, he had a ministry of words. He used words to bring people into the kingdom. But during the, those last few like days, Jesus doesn't say much. And the things that he does say, they, they matter, they're important. They matter and they're important because, and I would say this because of the emotional state that he was in. Yeah. And the emotional state that we can find ourselves when we go through bad days or hard times or difficult seasons. That's where Jesus was and he was very selective in the words that he says. So after the Last Supper, if you, if you look at it, after the Last Supper, he tells the disciples to stay awake and pray with him. He expends energy to say that. Can you just stay awake and pray with me? He does ask, and this is funny, he asks the angry mob in the garden, they come to get him, there's a whole angry mob, they come with weapons in the darkness, and Jesus asks them, why do you come with weapons? 
I've been in your synagogues preaching and teaching, and you didn't do anything there, and I was never aggressive, so why do you come at me with weapons? He does tell the disciples, because Peter gets so angry that he slices off that man's ear, and so Jesus says, he looks at his disciples, he says, now is not the time to fight back. Put your weapons down. That is not what I have called you to. But then after that, he says very little, because he's taken away in the darkness, and that's when he's made fun of, and he's asked questions. Are you the Messiah? Are you the one? And he doesn't answer. If you read it, he doesn't, he doesn't. And I find that so fascinating because Jesus knew who he was and he knew it was happening, but he's very selective in the way that, that he answers. Sarcastic question after sarcastic question. And it's recorded. What I find interesting, it's recorded that he says nothing. He says nothing in return. And so when the immediate picture is that Jesus, he's been abandoned, he's been left alone. But and it was one of the darkest, hardest, longest days of his life. Have you ever, have you ever been, have you ever felt like you've been in that place? It's a dark, long, hard day, and you've got nobody around you who can relate to your story. You've got nobody in that place, and it's, it's a place of desperation. Not only that, this is also one of the longest weeks of Jesus' life, because Jesus knew it was coming. He walks into Jerusalem. You guys remember the story? It's Palm Sunday, so he walks into Jerusalem, and there's this huge fanfare, if you read the Easter story. They, that's when the, he comes riding in on the donkey and then everybody begins, not necessarily because they understood who he was, but because the spirit of God was doing something in the hearts of people. And so they begin to celebrate and they praise and they, as a king coming in, they lay their coats down and they start waving palm branches. And Jesus comes in, he can see the emotional response of people. And then that week, if you go and pay attention to what Jesus says, all of the most power packed teachings that Jesus brings are in that last week. He expends a lot of energy that week because this is it. This is the end. This is his final moments here on earth. And it's, he, he brings a lot of stuff. And then this is uh, Wednesday night. He goes to sleep. Thursday morning wakes up. This is when the last supper happens. So, you know, it says, where are we going to eat the last supper meal? He tells his disciples, go find a place. There will be a place prepared for us. So that day, he go, Wednesday night, he goes to sleep. Thursday morning wakes up. They go, they prepare the last supper meal. They have it. And then in the middle of the night, they go to the garden to pray. That's when he's arrested and taken away. So we find, when we find Jesus, it's Friday morning. When he's crucified on that cross and we pick up that story, it's nine o'clock on Friday morning. And the last time Jesus had any sleep was Wednesday night. <laughs> Have you ever had like, um, okay, labor is a beautiful thing, you know, going into labor and having a baby, but not after uh, you just got back from camping. It's three weeks early and you're trying to go to sleep at night. Then it's a bad time. Anybody? You, you like, you just, uh, you know, some of us have really cool stories of, of labor and delivery and having babies, but uh, it was traumatic. And, you know, the hospital and you're, you're wheeled here. I know people in the room who've got crazy stories and it, it never comes out a perfect time. Or how about this? Um, I know of another... <laughs> another family. They were on their way to visit family in New Mexico. They're driving from California to New Mexico and their car breaks down like dead. Not going to be able to fix it. Not gonna, they're on their way to visit family. The only way that they're going to keep getting there is to stop off and buy a new car. <laughs> Talk, I mean, like it's celebratory because yay, new car, but also horrible timing, bad day. Or you ever, you have a really, really great weekend. You're spending time with friends. It's awesome. You're on your way home and you get in just a crazy car crash. And then you're, you know, you're in the hospital or people are injured and what was really good and exciting now ends in a very bad and traumatic moment. Or you're, you know, in the middle of a relationship, it's going well, you think it's going well, and all of a sudden that ends. That same week you go to the doctor and you get some bad news from the doctor. And so now this one thing that had been good, the door has shut. And then you go to the doctor and now you have more bad news. So you're surrounded by people. There's still people in your life, but for some reason you feel so desperately alone because now there's no one to connect your story to. And that's where Jesus was. That's where Jesus was on the cross. But, but I love what happens. So the longest, darkest, hardest day of Jesus' life, and he's alone. But when the story pans back out, remember we have those two guys. This is what we're kind of talking about. The two guys on either side of him. The people who are closest to Jesus aren't there in his darkest time of need. But he isn't alone because there's new people he can relate to in that place in his story. And so he's not looking for his friends to be there. He's looking around for who else can be my friend in this place. 
He didn't turn his back on his friends. He goes back and he restores them. He redeems them. He finds them. So what happens is he brings new people into a circle through that time of desperation. He enlarges his territory. He, is, he enlarges that circle of influence in that darkest time of need. And so that's what I want to say to some of us. Some of us, when we enter into those places, we feel abandoned by our friends. We feel alone. We feel desperate because who we knew and who we want to be there isn't there. And that doesn't mean that we turn our back on them, but who, the, who has God provided in that space? Who is where you are now that you can relate to? And I want to say this also because we look at the, the criminals on the cross. There was the one who was angry and mocking him, did, and Jesus didn't... Re- <laughs> Jesus didn't say anything to that man. He didn't try and rescue him. He didn't try and reason with him. He didn't try and defend himself. That wasn't the moment to, that man had made, in essence, that man had made his choices and Jesus was like, I can't do anything for you. And I, I love this about the Lord because he, he can, he is the redeemer. He's the rescuer. He transforms hearts but he doesn't make us do anything. And so that man chose anger and he got to hold on to it. But the other man chose repentance, and in that place of repentance, he found relationship. Um, And so the criminal says, Jesus, the one criminal's repentance says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered that man. He didn't say anything to the other one. (laughs) I am, but I wonder, because he was already, how much more angry was the one on the other side when Jesus said something to that guy? You know, I don't know. Jesus answered that guy, that one. I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Again, on the longest, darkest, loneliest day of Jesus' human experience, he somehow finds the strength and compassion to speak words and offer that man life and hope. He's, he's hanging on the cross. He's, he's naked. He's been beaten. He's been bruised. He's been mocked. He's been ridiculed. I imagine he probably doesn't have a ton of energy left in his body. But he takes time to respond to that one person. And my, my question is how? Because when we find ourselves in places like that where it's been the longest, hardest, darkest day or season of our life and we feel like we're completely tapped, we're completely maxed out, how can we continue to be like Jesus? Because it's part of the Christian, it's part of the Christian walk. Hebrews 12, 2, our theme scripture comes from here. It says, keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God, he could put up with anything along the way, the cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor, right alongside God. And so on the most embarrassing, this is the most embarrassing day of Jesus' life. And I'll say this is why it's the most embarrassing day of Jesus' life, because he was the word of life. Everything creates, he created and everything existed and is held together by him and through him and for him. He gave everything for us and we put him on the cross. And so have you ever felt like you you were so vulnerable? You opened up your heart with love and affection and you gave everything you are to a person or to someone. And then there, there's, there's that moment of embarrassment and shame where you want to close off everything. And that's where Jesus was. It was a completely embarrassing moment because he's the king of all kings And he's being crucified by the people that he loves most. And they just don't know it. They just don't get it. They just, they haven't seen it. And so how did he offer hope? And I want to, again, so the, the, there's, the, if you're taking notes, you can fill in the blanks here. I only have two of them. And the, the idea is how do we offer hope to others when my life seems bad? So when my life seems bad, how can I be someone who still offers hope to other people? And I say that not because we're Christians and so we have to try really hard to have it all together and to have all the answers and to be amazing and I'm never supposed to have anything wrong with my life. That's not why. It's because... The scripture says, keep your eyes on Jesus who both began a good work and he's, he finished the race that we're in. Study how he did it. And it's because we're invited into a transforming relationship with the King of all kings. It's not because I have to have it all together, but it's because the Lord wants to transform some things in my life so that I can be like he is. I can do what he does. I can provide hope in that place. I can sit in that place. So um, the first one is this. Keep your eyes open to see others who are struggling or uncertain. It's simple. Keep your eyes open to see others who are struggling or uncertain. And I want you guys to capture this. The criminal was experiencing the exact same physical pain as Jesus. 
the exact same physical pain as Jesus. They were in it together. And I'm going to say this, arguably Jesus' bad day was way worse than the, either one of those criminals because, because his physical pain was exacerbated by his emotional and spiritual pain. Jesus had already been abandoned by his friends and he knew what was coming. He knew that all of the sin of the entire world, past, present, future, our sins today were going to be pinned on him in that moment and Jesus knew it. So Jesus' physical pain is completely exacerbated by all of the emotions and all of the spiritual stuff coming because his father, he knows his father is utterly and completely going to turn his back on him. And Jesus could have been so focused on his own pain and his own problems that he ignored the pain and the hurt of those next to him because he just needed to buckle down and get through it. How many of us want to do that? Like we enter into those moments of pain and loneliness and suffering. And so we're just going to close ourselves off and we're just going to get through it. But Jesus says, keep your eyes on me and study how I did it because I'm transforming you and I'm going to help you keep your heart open in the middle of that. And when you keep your heart open, you're going to be transformed and you're going to find hope and healing. And he wants to invite us into that. So he demonstrated sensitivity and he remained available to the needs of other people, even while dealing with his own pain. And so there's that's my question. How do you do that? How do you keep your eyes open when you're in your own pain? And I'm going to say it, you can see people because you've been there. And you or you are there. And you can see it in their eyes. You can you can hear it in their voice. You can sense it in their actions. And, and here's what I'll say. I, I believe that the Lord, is a, the Lord is a very sensitive person. He's not a person. He's a God. But he's a very sensitive God. He's an emotion. All of the emotions and the sensitivity and the way we relate to people comes from our Father in heaven, the creator of the universe, who created us in his image and in his likeness. And so when we, and I think our, t- I'm, uh, I know my tendency, uh, when I see people in pain, I want to run away because there ain't no way I'm getting involved in that. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's no way I have the emotional capacity to solve all your problems. There's no way I have the shoulders to be able to burden what it is that you're going through. And so we, we see it. I know that we see it. We see it in the eyes of other people. And we can sense it in the words that we're, they're saying. And you can see it in, in the way they lash out or the actions that they have. And so the invitation from Jesus is simply just to draw near and to sit next to. And not to shoulder the burden, but to offer hope as one who has been in that same bad day struggle. Who has been in that same place. To offer your emotions in that you can, scripture says that you cry together. You mourn with those who are mourning. And so maybe you're not actively mourning, but you come into that place of remembrance and you can mourn with them. And so now they're not alone. And maybe you weren't their friend before. If they, if they were to look at their circle of friends, you weren't in it. <laughs> But now you are, you have entered into that place. And because God is good, he has enlarged your territory and he he brings compassion in. And I would say this, you're not alone. You know, we're not Jesus with all the answers. And so sometimes it's hard for us to enter that place because I don't have the answers. And what if they ask me something really deep, like, why is this happening? Does God love me? I don't know. I mean, yes, I know that God loves you. (laughs) I'm not unsure of that. I I know that, but I'm not sure why that's happening. But you know what I can do is I can sit with you in the the middle of it. And I would say this, because you're providing hope and assurance for other people, but you can even provide hope and assurance for your own self in those places, which I can tell you confidently that Jesus did first. When Jesus went to the cross, as he looked at the cross, he knew it was coming, and he looked at the wave— of loss that was coming over him, he had to speak to himself. You guys know that Jesus had to speak to himself to get himself through that. He had to look beyond that immediate moment to what was coming after. And he encouraged himself. We sang that song, open the grave, I'm coming out. And and then he says, "Uh, I'm going to live, I'm going to live again. Jesus was declaring that, open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm going to live, I'm going to live again. And what happens in our own life is we're not dead, but we die. Parts of us get buried because life gets hard. And struggles happen. And so we bury parts of who we are. And we live in that place and we hope for the future. That life is going to be better in heaven. But right now I'm just going to buckle down and it's going to be hard. And Jesus says, open the grave. I'm coming out. I came to give you life. And I came to give you life abundant. 
Come out of, he says, come out of the grave. So he spoke to himself. He looked beyond the moment and says, I'm coming out of that grave and I'm bringing hope and healing and rescue for all of you. And you don't know it yet, but it's coming. And so he held on to that. And I'll say this because God didn't just save you for you. He saved you for others. And so you, when you offer hope and healing and when you sit in that place, and you relate in that moment of struggle, you, you have your eyes open. You don't know what's happening in your own life and you don't know what hap- is what's happening there, but you know what? I know that my God is gonna open up the grave and you're gonna come out of it. And I be, because I know that I'm going to sit here and it's not going to look anything like I think it's going to look, but something spiritually powerful is happening behind the scenes in your heart. And my God is bringing transformation. And that's, that's what Jesus did. He fixed his, if Jesus fixed his eyes on the plans that he had made with his father. And from that place of assurance, he weathered that bad day. I've done this in my own life. And you look through the heroes of the faith, you read Hebrews 11, you can see that every hero of the faith has done this in their own life. I don't know how it's going to turn out. I don't know if it's going to turn in my favor, but I do know that this world is not my home. And I know that God honors the humble. And I know that those who mourn will be comforted because God draws near to the brokenhearted. And I know that there is no place where I can run from his presence. I know that he rewards those who are obedient to his words and fulfill his laws and delight in his laws. I know that he is the father of lights from whom all good things come. And if I, a human parent, know how to give good gifts to my children, then my father in heaven certainly knows how to give even better gifts to me. And I know that he is able to make all things abound to those who find themselves in his in Christ Jesus and I know that if I remain in him he will remain in me and nothing will be impossible I know that I can say to that mountain be uprooted and thrown into the sea and it will move and be uprooted and thrown into the sea because he is good and faithful I'm going to tell you church if you guys don't know the words of God you need to get into the word of God you need to wrestle and struggle with the promises that don't make sense You need to get in a community of people. If you're not in a life group, get in a life group. They are up and running. And you can find them in your bulletins. They're still up and running. It's not too late to get in one. Because what happens is when the community of God wrestles with the promises of God, we find strength. We're We're not created to do this Jesus walk alone. We're created to do it in community with other people. We wrestle together with the promises of God. We wrestle together with the things that we don't understand. And in that place of wrestling together, a hope and assurance and a confidence come over us because he is the creator and he's one God, three persons. And he says, do life in community with other people and I will be present. Where two or three of you are gathered there, I will be in the midst of you. I will minister to you there you can get on a Bible reading plan also. The YouVersion Bible app, if you get on that, you can find a plan, you can read it with friends and you can ask each other like, what's this mean? I'm, I'm having a hard time with this and sit with the promises of God. I've done that. I have, I have read the scripture and I said, I don't, I don't know how that makes sense. But eventually over time, the Lord begins to minister to me and he begins to help me see those things and it doesn't happen immediately. It happens over time. And so don't give up. Don't give up. Keep writing down those promises. Keep asking those questions. Keep, that's what it means to seek the Lord. That's what it means to seek the Lord. I'm going to seek understanding. I'm going to be okay with the fact that I don't get this. And I'm going to be okay with the fact that I'm frustrated. And I'm going to keep seeking. You have, if you're a believer, I don't know if you believe this or not, or you know this or not, but you have a hope and an assurance because of who he is. And the Lord wants to invite you to find that. Sometimes what happens is in moments of when we're struggling, and we're having a really bad day, and we're looking for hope, we're looking for answers, that would be a place called the wilderness. And the Lord brings us to the place of the wilderness because, I, because he wants, hmm. The Lord just did this in me, in me recently. He brings us to that place of wilderness because he wants to meet us there. He wants us, and I, he's a good God, and so that seems questionable. He's a good God, but he leads us into places of desperation so that he can show up. And he can do something big. Okay, the second thing we can do is that uh, help others who are experiencing your same struggle. Help others who are experiencing your same struggle. So even um, Jesus knew who he was. He was the king of all kings. He knew why he came. He knew that this was part of the process. And so Jesus could have regarded himself as superior. I mean, honestly. 
All, all, he, all, he, he could have gotten himself off the cross. And so it's true in that moment of pain and suffering, Jesus had more resources available to him than either of the other two men. He did. He knew who he was, he knew what was happening, he knew why it was happening, and he knew what was on the other side of it. The other two men didn't have that available to them, but Jesus doesn't relate to them from that place. And that's what I want us to hear. It wasn't from a place of spiritual royalty or superiority that Jesus responded to that man. Jesus met him on the common plane of their mutual suffering on that bad day. They were both in a place of desperation. You remember back in the garden, Jesus is on his face. He's, he's sweating blood and he asked his father, is there any other way? Jesus wanted off that cross before he ever even got there. But he spoke to himself and said, on the other side of that, I'm going to live again. And when I live again, you all live again. And so he went through the pain and the suffering, but he knew what it felt like to be in that place of, can I just get out of here? Can I not do it this way? Is there any other way to do it? And so in watching Jesus respond to the thief on the cross from his own cross, we see that Jesus charted the way for us learning that whatever our bad day may involve, he's still calling us to be present with other people. When we study how we did it, we keep our eyes on Jesus. And I think this is probably where the bigger hurdle for us lies because we're going to justify the reasons why we find ourselves in our bad day struggle Um, or the the time when we need help. We're going to justify, but we're going to condemn the others next to us. Because we, life was going good. We've been with our friends. We have a circle of friends. We find ourselves in this lonely place of, of darkness or like just confusion, whatever it is. And then now we, see pe- now we see people we didn't see before because we were here and it was good. And I didn't really see you. Or I didn't really care about you. I was condemning you, you know. And then it happens to us. And now we're like, oh, I'm in the same place you were. Okay, but we justify how we got there. And this is what happens because we say they were an idiot. Anybody? I'm not the only one who talks like that. Um, They made bad choices. They deserve what they are getting. Serves them right, maybe they'll learn this. No compassion. Serves them right, maybe they'll learn this time. I'm not helping you. Like, deal with it. Um, But we say about our own self, "I I don't deserve, I don't deserve what I'm getting. God should save me. I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. I, you know, like I get some things right. So save me all the time. This isn't my fault. It's because of this and this and this and this and this and this and this. Like we justify why we find ourselves sometimes in that place. Now, can I tell you something? That criminal was an idiot. Well, both of them were. But I'm talking about the one that Jesus responded to. That criminal was an idiot. He did make bad choices. He did deserve what he was getting, and he knew it because he said it. He said, we are getting what we deserve, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Crucifixion did serve that criminal right, and Jesus didn't deserve what he was getting, and it wasn't his fault. He was actually on the cross in part due to that man's sin. He was on the cross for that man because that man was an idiot. God doesn't call us idiots. I call myself. I need you to know that God doesn't think of you that way. You're a blessed and loved, beloved child of the living God, and he doesn't talk to us like that. In my own human sin nature, I put words on myself that the enemy would put on me, and that's not how God speaks to us, okay? He was actually on the cross in part for that man's sin. So here's the deal. Jesus could have been angry and grumpy at that man. (laughs) He could have said, yeah, you're right. And not offered him any hope. Like, you're right. Like, he could have said that. But Jesus wasn't angry. He was hopeful. And he gave that man hope. Why? Because on the other side of that pain was promise. And he held on to the promise and it pulled him through the pain. Jesus held on to the promise and it pulled him through the pain. And because he held on to the promise of what was coming, he could experience pain and still help someone else. And guys, the same is true for you. The same is true for me. The same is true for us. There is promise for us that brings us through the pain. And it's because of, you know, we live in a cursed world. The world is cursed. We will experience sin. We will experience suffering. But that's not the be all end all that's going to put us in the grave of suffering for the rest of our life. 
Open the grave. I'm coming out. I'm going to live. I'm going to live again. On the other side of the pain, there is promise. Second Corinthians 1, 3 and 4 says this. Paul is writing to the church and he says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our trouble so that we can comfort others. How many of you know he comforted Jesus in the garden? So that Jesus could comfort that man on the cross. When we are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us because we are going to be troubled, but God isn't going to leave us alone in our trouble. He's going to comfort us. And from that place of comfort, we're going to be able to turn around and give it to somebody else. And so I'll say this, if you're in a place of struggle, maybe you're not ready yet to give it away to someone else, but there's someone who's been through it, who's ready to give you comfort. And then after you've been comforted, you can turn then and give it to someone else. This scripture relates one of the classic strategies of our most high God who uses his children who have endured difficulty to become strength to others who are experiencing that same trial. Guys, it's the divine, we believe in divine things. It is the divine reminder that we comfort others, not from a foundation of superior faith, but from the commonality of our mutual struggles. So in your struggle, where you are wrestling through your own faith and trying to reconcile how a good God could let these things happen, or if God is my provider, then why am I experiencing lack? If I've been faithful and obedient, then why was that thing taken from me? That's wrestling with your own faith. That's asking the big questions and seeking God through it. In that place where you're trying to cling through promises and you're sorting through your emotions, can I give you hope today that you have more impact from that place of being relatable than you do when your life is sunshine and roses and you're shouting from the rooftops how good your God is. And it's good. God brings us to those places where we shout and we declare, God is so good. But you ever feel like it's really hard to connect with people sometimes when you're shouting from the rooftops and they're down in the valley, destitute and alone? And so we find ourselves in those valleys and together. And can I say that people watch your pain? And so when God is the one who sustains you in your pain and you have questions and it's not your superior faith that says, bless the Lord, oh my soul, I'm so good today. And you never talk about your struggle. You never talk. And I'm not saying that we live in a place where we're always talking about, oh, bless the Lord. You know what? Life, life's really hard. I'm going through something, but this is what the Lord is doing in me, or this is what I'm asking the Lord to do. From that place, the Lord ministers to us. And we know what he does is he rescues them and he rescues you in only a way that you can. And he enlarges your territory and expands your influence because he gives power to the weak and he gives strength to the powerless. We like to be people who never have struggle. We like to be people who have it all together. We like to to never need anything. And sometimes God's invitation to us is, let me meet you in your struggle. Let me meet you in your pain. Can you be honest with how painful that is? Can you be honest with how bad your day is going with me? Not, not necessarily here, but with me, can you be honest with what's going on in your heart and what you're struggling with? Because I'm going to give you something. I want to deposit something to you. And then I'm going to open your eyes and I'm going to show you the people around you who are in that same spot. And then you're going to be able to go and you're going to be able to give hope and life. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for who you are. God, you are bigger than we could imagine. Lord, in the depths of your love, the depths of your glory, the depths of who you are, Lord, are mind-boggling sometimes. And so, Father, I ask that we would begin to wrestle with some of the uncomfortable emotions that we experience in life. And as we do that, Father, we would find redemption, we would find love, we would find revelation, and we would find understanding. Because you're not just a good God with good feelings and good emotions. You're a good God who meets us even in those places because those even were created by you. And you know how to redeem, you know how to restore, you know how to fulfill. Lord, for those of us who find ourselves with family members or friends who are in a deep, dark day struggle, 
In the name of Jesus, I speak your truth and I speak your light and I speak your love upon those situations. And I ask for, Lord, I do begin to ask for dreams, Lord, and words of vision and words of prophecy and words of hope. Lord, as we contend for the lives of other people, would you give us the words to say? Would you give us the compassion to sit next to? Because that's who you are. In our loneliness and in our suffering, you come and you sit next to us because you draw near to the brokenhearted. Would you help us to be a people who are not afraid to sit next to the brokenhearted? Would you help us to transform our community and our cities in that way? If you're in the room today and you want to, to come to know the Lord, you want to enter into that space of relationship, or you're in a place where you're struggling and you just need God to meet you, you want God to do a work on your heart, where you would say, you know, I'm not that good at ministering to the brokenhearted. I'm not, I'm not that comfortable with entering into that space. But you would say, I want to because my God has met me there or I want my God to meet me there. Would you just lift your hand up because I want to I pray with you and I want to pray for you. I see your hands. Amen. God is good. You guys can just repeat this prayer after me. Father God, I thank you that you are good. I thank you for your son who paid the ultimate price to give me everything I need. You have more for me. You are a God of abundance. And I receive your love. I receive your power. I receive your spirit to do the things that you have called me to do. Amen.